Welcome back to Uprising. I'm speaking with Vandana Shiva. She's here in Los Angeles. And uh, in addition to uh, what you've discussed regarding the various cases that you've brought up, earlier in the first part of our interview, you referred to this uh, two-week-long seed freedom movement that you've been involved in um, that successfully overturned this memorandum of understanding. Tell us a little bit about that. What did you engage in the first two weeks of October um, and how, uh, what, what, would, what did the activism look like on the ground for yeah. some of the issues you've been talking about? Well, first and early, you know, the seed freedom movement, we've started 25 years ago, and we call it Beat Swaraj, mm -hmm. Seed Sovereignty. Uh, this year we've made it global, and 2nd October, Gandhi's birth anniversary to 16th October World Food Day, was a concentrated fortnight of action. The seed re free freedom movement will not stop till the seed is liberated and the seed is free, till the farmers are free to save their seeds, till the eaters are free to know what seeds were used to grow their crop, whether GMO or not GMO, but more importantly, they have the diversity in the field to choose diversity in their kitchens and on their plates. So it's, it's going to take as long as it takes. And I believe deeply that if we around the world are in synergies, then we are like a laser and a laser can cut. You don't see it. There's nothing hard out there in those beams. And yet when all the uh, energy comes together, a laser beam can chop up anything. We have to become political laser beams of uprising against the seed slavery of ownership of seed, forcing of genetically or organized organism. What does the movement look on the ground? Beautiful where we've saved our seeds, 110 community seed banks. Tsunami happens in Tamil Nadu, our farmers of Orissa say we're going to donate two truckloads of salt tolerant seeds and we take it down. It's Ladakh, which is an arid zone where they have amazing seeds, but they were made to believe that you are primitive, your seeds are primitive, give it all up. They say no, you are a proud culture and your seeds are proud diversity of this land. It means on the ground, farmers, when they develop an understanding of the seed, develop an understanding of agriculture, they give up chemical farming. They create GMO-free, chemical-free zones, patent-free zones, living democracy. More than 6,000 villages in India consciously practicing a living democracy. Incomes going up five times, production going up two to three times. Nobody hungry. Nobody in debt, no suicides in these areas. Where it comes to mobilization, it's these farmers who are then the ones who tell other farmers. So when we got the MOU of Rajasthan cancelled, we had a caravan of farmers stopping to talk to government officials, stopping to talk to other farmers, stopping to talk to research institutions, to talk about what this MOU was, because these are always secret deals. And that's the other thing that goes in hand with GMOs and seed patterns. Secrecy. Hide from the public. Let deals be made between governments that have been bought and these big corporations. So we lay it out. We put the sunshine on these secrets. And, um, and then the pressure carries on, because Part of what is needed at this point is more information in the hands of the public in order to act with full awareness, full consciousness and full responsibility. I'm wondering how you see Americans learning from uh, what you and the farmers in India have done because here in the United States, although of course we've got a, a rich culture of small farmers, much of our food system is controlled by big agribusinesses. Although when Monsanto of course talks about beating Prop 37, they talk about doing it on behalf of small farmers, but they mean big agribusinesses. Uh, in the U.S., do you see this more as a consumer's movement rather than a farmer's movement or a hybrid? Um, I think uh, the small family farm of this country has been destroyed by big agribusiness. The United States, like India, was a land of small farmers. But there is a huge explosion of small farmers, especially the organic movement, is new agriculture. It's a whole new movement. I saw data that majority of small organic farmers are actually women. Mm. Urban women moving to do agriculture. In Navdanya, 
you know, I built this movement Navdanya, which means nine seeds, and uh, we have a farm, which is a teaching and research farm and a biodiversity conservation farm, where we are at this moment harvesting 630 varieties of rice. Um, we get people from around the world, including a lot of young Americans, who want to become farmers or chefs or whatever, something in the food system. Um, and this is for two reasons. One is the options are anyway closing. After the collapse of 2008, why is Occupy all Wall Street such an important movement in this country? Because the youth recognize that their future is being closed by a Wall Street-driven, Monsanto-driven, Walmart-driven economy. But the second is, those who do have the option to have a job realize how dead these jobs are. They're not fulfilling. And people are seeking a deeper meaning in life, working with the earth, protecting seeds. Now, our report on seed freedom has many, many, many contributions of seed savers in this country. So it's a huge, huge movement. And this issue of seed freedom and the issue of fighting these giants will also be an issue of the small initiatives. It will be an issue for the children. I see in the future the movement for edible education, the movement of school gardens being a major political force because when that child has tasted a healthy tomato and more than that gone through the miracle of t having that seed give them a hundred tomatoes, that child can never be brainwashed into the idea of scarcity for dependence on Monsanto. That child can never ever be sterilized to think bad food is good for you. They will celebrate taste and quality and nutrition and freedom. That is going to be a very important set of players. But of course, consumers. And I believe the moment has reached, and I'm doing this in India, and I think this needs to be done in the United States. We always made to believe that because organic is costly, and it's costly because the subsidies go to the poisons, uh, that therefore it's an option for the rich. But the point is, there are huge subsidies to make that chemical food, that GMO food, move to the poor. All we have to do is redirect our tax money, just like we have a right to know what we eat. We have a right to decide how our tax money will be used for the public good rather than private greed. It's time to say stop the public subsidies for food stamps and in India the public distribution system, the school meals, the feeding of the women and children or, or in vulnerable groups. That every bit of this in India is a one trillion rupee market. GMOs is what they would like to sell. Local organic is what we want to get there. Relevant to America as much as to India. Now, if every school had an organic meal. If every food stamp was buy safe, good quality, nutritious food from local farmers, one, we would have employment of a huge kind in the food sheds around every city. The costs would go down. It would be totally affordable and we'd get rid of the green uh, of the food deserts in the city while we get rid of the green deserts on our farmland tell me more about the seed freedom report you're holding a copy in your hand and yeah. it's hefty it's very hefty. Uh, i didn't uh, expect it to get that <laughs> and it's called a global citizens report yeah. um what went into putting this together what went into putting it together was writing to everyone i knew uh, and because I've now done this work for 25 years, I do know a lot of seed savers around the world. Um, every person who's fighting against patenting or illegitimate seed laws that say you can't have your own seed, uh, basically criminalizing diversity, farmers breeding and seed freedom. Um, and just telling them that A, we wanted to create a global alliance, two, we wanted to put out a report. And the beauty of it is, it is really a collective endeavor of more than 120 groups and organizations from around the world. And we know this is not complete, because this is just the people we knew, and we are going to carry on building this movement. More than 100,000 people have signed the Declaration for Seed Freedom. It's available on the website of www.seedfreedom.in as I in India, um, join this amazing movement. And it's not just about a signature, it's about taking action. Start saving seed if you can, even if it's a little pot in your balcony, it's a little kitchen garden. If you're a school child, make your garden a seed sanctuary. In India we call it Seeds of Freedom, Gardens of Hope. They go together. A garden with toxic genes is not a garden. 
I noticed uh, organizations in Latin America, yes. uh, African organizations yeah. as well. So how um, strong is this movement now that is um, recognizing the stranglehold of companies like Monsanto on our food system? And does it give you hope? You've been doing this for a really long time, but these companies have so much money, so much power. As you've said, they've put scientists out of work for daring to show that these things are dangerous. But is this movement big enough to overcome the Monsantos and Walmarts of the world? Well, I believe that the movement that we've grown so far is a very small part of the movement that has to grow. There is not an individual anywhere on this planet who can afford to not be part of this movement. We can't be bystanders and watchers of the stealing of our democracies, the stealing of the future of our children, the stealing of our health, because we know we have enough evidence now that GMOs do cause harm. Every independent research shows it. But forget the empirical research. The science tells you that. If you put an antibiotic resistance in marker into food, you know there will be a jumping gene that will take that antibiotic resistance gene, hybridize with your genes in the stomach, give you resistance to antibiotics, and if you are a TB patient taking canamycin, you are not going to cure yourself. So these, this is predictive science. You can tell what will happen given the theoretical uh, science at the level of the gen uh, of, of genetics. Um, so everyone will have to get involved because they're playing with our lives. They're playing with the very fabric. After all, food is, we are what we eat and seed is the first link in the food chain. So if we don't reclaim the seed, liberate the seed, we don't. We can't protect the environment. If we don't save the seeds for climate resilience, if we don't do organic farming, there is no solution to climate change. The energy solutions are part of it. 40% of the damage is coming from industrial agribusiness. 40% of the damage is coming from long distance transport. Um, so when you say I'm hopeful, of course I'm deeply hopeful because we are talking about the convergence of the freedom spirit not just of 7 billion people on the planet, but 300 million species. Now, what are five corporations in front of that? You know, on the one hand, one might say, oh, you've been doing this for 25 years. You know, they had said by 2000, they'd control all the seed. They control soya and corn and cotton and canola. They are never, ever going to make us stop our seed saving. The 3,000 varieties of rice we've saved will always be free. And every time they come with a threat, we are going to tell them what Gandhi told the British when he walk, walked, walked to the beach, picked up the salt. The British thought they could make salt their monopoly and collect royalties. Um, and he said, nature gives it for free. We need it for our survival. We will continue to make salt. We will not obey your law. It was called the salt satyagraha. Inspired from that, from 91 onwards, we've been practicing the seed satyagraha. I stopped a seed law that would have criminalized seed saving in India that would have made farmer seeds illegal. I took a hundred thousand signatures to our Prime Minister and said, you know, Gandhi taught us that bad laws should not be obeyed. So you can pass this law, but we will continue to save our seeds. And so far we've got a hundred thousand signatures, we'll be a million, we'll be two million, we'll be three million. We're not going to stop because too much is at stake. Too much is at stake. Unlike every other movement where it's just about the environment, it's just about animal welfare, it is just about human rights, this is one movement in which every movement of every time of history, in every dimension of human freedom, comes together. We can't afford to let them walk over us. You brought up climate change, and I'm really glad you did, because uh, we're coming off of this devastating uh, superstorm, Sandy, on the East Coast that is now being called the new normal. And yet we live here in the United States in a country um, where there are so many people in power who are climate deniers, climate change deniers. Make the linkages for us between the seed monopolies and climate change between the Monsantos of the world and climate change because that isn't an obvious connection. I mean, certainly they both impact the environment, but it seems like in very different ways. Well, there's so many connections between what we do to seed 
and what's happening to the climate. And all the climate skeptics, you know, at the end of it, they can't deny that there are more unpredictable climate extremes taking place. I did a massive study in the Himalaya and I talked to any villager who has zero idea of climate science and I'd ask, is the climate changing? Yes, it is. Why do you think it's changing? Human responsibility. We are polluting the environment. We are polluting the atmosphere. And there has to be a consequence. Ordinary person in a village in the Himalaya understands that pollution has impact. In the case of air pollution, the impact is climate instability. And these extreme droughts, and you have a double whammy this year, an extreme drought and the superstorm and you still have the climate des denies. I wrote a book called Soil no Not Oil and when I was doing the work for that book I realized that 40% of all greenhouse gas emissions are coming from an industrial chemical form of farming and long distance transport that it's necessarily linked to. Three gases are nitrogen oxide you get them from chemical fertilizers. Mm. Nitrogen oxide escapes into the atmosphere. Very tiny amount is taken up by the plant. Very face wasteful state waste of fertilizing plants. A tiny amount is taken up by the plant. Most of it runs off into rivers and oceans, creating dead zones. And a large part escapes into the atmosphere as nitrogen oxide, 300 times more deadly in climate instability than carbon dioxide. Fossil fuel use, these giant farms are very fossil fuel intensive. As Emery Lovins of the Rocky Mountain Institute has shown, 300 slaves behind every big caterpillar tractor driver. Mm. We don't count them, but the atmosphere is counting them. The climate is counting them. And that huge energy footprint is converted into a pollution footprint at the level of carbon dioxide. All the animals imprisoned in f animal factories, which they call CAFOs, fed grain. Cows weren't designed to eat grain. They have four stomachs. They are herbivores. Cows that graze on grass don't keep farting. Huh. The cows that gr are fed this intensive feed have loose motion all the time. I've seen them in the dairies and in the meat stocks. Okay. Constant. So that's that methane. The uh, methane, the stink. That you, the reason people don't want a CAFO in their neighborhood is that stink. That's methane. And that contributes to climate change. It is. It's the third biggest uh, greenhouse gas. Now, the combination of this is 40% of all greenhouse gas emissions. But that's not all. The soil that you've created out of chemical fertilizer is a soil that has been deprived of the real organic matter. It is not able to hold moisture. You get a drought of the kind you have this year. There is absolute failure of a crop. All you need is a little more organic matter. You can have 20% more water in your soil. Your pastures won't die your grasslands will be alive, your crops won't die. You don't need the fake science and fake promises of Monsanto. All you need is good farming. Resilience in terms of biodiversity, resilience in terms of carbon in the soil, and our studies show that you can increase carbon in the soil up to 200% with good ecological farming. This Li is living carbon. It gives you more food, it gives you more water, it gives you more resilience. So we have one path, reduce your pollution from all of these aspects of chemical agriculture and increase your resilience. What they are saying is increase the pollution, don't count it, lie about it, pretend you are the solvers of climate change. And Monsanto and friends have patented a thousand five hundred patents on climate resilient crops, which they have not evolved. They are gambling, just like they gambled on Wall Street with de derivatives, they are gambling on reading the genome. They are not breeding, they have no idea about the plant, they have no idea about anything, they are betting by saying, oh maybe this group of genes, maybe this contributes to drought resistance. So we can't, I mean, just like we can't afford to put our financial economy in the hands of Wall Street, we can't afford to put the living economy of this planet and its genetic diversity and the need to prepare for climate change in the hands of the genetic gamblers, the Monsantos. Well, that brings me to my final question, which is the economy is inextricably tied to how food is created, bought and sold 
in today's corporate capitalist driven economy. The Monsantos and Walmarts, uh, particularly Monsanto, as you were saying, uh, rely on GMOs because they can own the patents and they can make money that way. And this uh, never-ending growth model that uh, we're told is the only model for our, uh, running our economic system uh, assumes that there are never-ending resources on this planet, which of course there aren't. What do you see finally as an alternative to this um, global economic system that we call capitalism that is in many ways driving both climate change as well as the uh, end of, of um, biodiversity. Do you see small-scale capitalism and markets? Uh, do you back things like socialist alternatives, etc.? I think we need a far more radical shift to deal with this new mythology of limitless growth. Um, and that shift is taking place. It's taking place for example, in that tiny uh, country called Bhutan, mm. which said we're not going to measure GDP, gross national product, gross domestic product, because they measure nothing but the commercialization and commodification of society. If I cut my forest and sell off the timber, I have growth. But I have no forest. I have no water. This is why the Chipko movement, the first movement I was part of, said these trees provide water, not timber. Change your mindset. Uh, they shifted, Bhutan shifted to gross national happiness. And happiness not in an empty way, it's happiness and well-being. People need to remember that wealth, the original root of wealth, is well-being. Wheel, well-being. Hmm. Wealth, the state of well-being. That's where we are coming to now, again. Coming back to the real meaning of the term. Economy, derived from oikos. Looking after your home, looking after this planet. Ecology and economy were two sides of the same coin. One was the science and one was the management. Ecology was the science, economy was the management. Aristotle said, Oikonomia is the art of living. Chromatistics is the art of money making. We have taken the art of money making which has created the oligarchs, has allowed the stealing of our democracies, has given us poisoned food, has given us climate change, disappeared of our diversity. That art of money making is being called the art of living and the end of human life. It's time to reclaim our humanity our future and it's a very exciting moment I work with the government of Bhutan they've asked us to help make them 100% organic because as the Prime Minister wrote to me he said I can only see one way of growing happiness and that is growing organic they've also set up a think tank of every person anywhere in the world who's rethinking the economic paradigm and this huge alliance that we are creating is called AND the alliance for the new paradigm uh, a, a new definition of the economy. So if you add the fact that 50% of the youth are being thrown into redundancy, that's what the case for Spain, Greece, Italy. Look at the Occupy movement in this country. The ancient wisdoms that are resurging again. The ecology movement that's taking a new shape. Women's movement that's saying this was never our economy. And if you look at what for feminist economics is saying, it's absolutely the same as put well-being at the center, the well-being of other species, the well-being of humanity. You get another economics. Stop measuring money transactions. Start measuring the health of our rivers, our forests, our children, our communities. Not very difficult. Most of the work's been done. Now, we need the political power to shift the ground. Again, Proposition 34, 37 is that little, little test case for many, many of the other issues that are related to this. Well, Vandana Shiva, it's always an honor to have you on the program. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. It's my pleasure, and I wish all the strength uh, to the vote on uh, November the 6th, not just for Proposition 37, for the larger election too, mm -hmm. because both are about the same thing. Will money rule our lives? or will we govern ourselves? Thank you again.